This is Mind Pump. Oh boy. Today's episode, we brought back on Dr. Khan. This is the guy that's on the cutting edge of science for longevity, for health, for healing, teaching your body or getting your body to regenerate. Like we're talking about stuff that you can't even do here in the States yet. Like it's crazy, crazy cutting edge stuff. He breaks it all down. He is a genius in the field. In fact, in today's episode, you hear about our experience with them. We actually had to go down to Mexico to use some of these treatments. And uh, Adam alone, by the way, who's been struggling with psoriasis for half his life, has seen some of the best improvements he's ever seen. And this guy's been to like every doctor for it. Um, this is wild. If you're like, if you want to know the cutting edge, you want to know what's coming on the horizon in the next 10 to 15 years, you want to listen to this episode. He breaks it all down. Dr. Adil Khan. By the way, He's running a regenerative medical conference. This is a, a medical conference. It's called Unlock Longevity. You can attend. He's got some very well-known speakers. By the way, Dr. Khan works with some of the best athletes and celebrities and billionaires in the world. Like this guy is incredible. This conference can have over 500 people. You're gonna learn some crazy stuff there. And if you go through this link, you'll get a discount on a ticket. You get 20% off, in fact. Go to in, uh, Eterna. E-T-E-R-N-A, so eterna.health forward slash unlock dash longevity. Then use the code mindpump20 and you'll get 20% off the ticket price. All right, today's giveaway is the RGB bundle. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, trainers and coaches, three days left for the sale and the free stuff with our new trainer course. We put a course out finally for trainers and coaches that teaches you how to build your business, teaches you how to be more successful. We put stuff in this course that you'll get nowhere else. Stuff that we found that makes the biggest impact for trainers and coaches. And because it's a launch, here's what you get if you sign up over the next three days. Free MAPS Prime program, free MAPS Prime Pro program. You get to attend a live lead generation masterclass. You get all 11 MAPS mods for free all 13 maps guides for free. You get $200 off and you get included in a private Facebook group for trainers and coaches. If you're interested, go to mindpumpfitnesscoaching.com, use the code 200 off for the discount. Also three days left for the new year's workout program bundles, all of them 300 to $350 off. Here's what they are, okay? New year to weightlifting bundle, the, excuse me, new to weightlifting bundle, the body transformation bundle, the new year extreme intensity bundle, and the Body Transformation Bundle 2.0. If you're interested in those, go to mapsjanuary.com. All right, here we are with Dr. Khan. Welcome back, Dr. Khan. Yeah, I'm on my own this time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that was fun. So we came down, we talked a little bit about this on the show, right? We came down to Mexico, come see you to get some treatments and stuff. Can we talk about what you did to us and what you gave us? And <laughs> yeah, please tell the yeah. audience how I genetically modified you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put some cells We're into your body. We're human beings now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Justin's erection uh, has improved by 30%. Yeah, yeah. Substantial. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. so what's the, so what's the, what's, so yeah, talk about that. So you gave a stem cell. So let's talk about that first and what, what, what that procedure was like. And you know, we'll tell, talk a little bit because we all notice a difference for sure. Yeah. So, let, so that, let's start with that. Yeah. I, and I think I have to paint a little bit of a picture because the problem is you can, you can type stem cell into Google right now and you'll probably get like a hundred different stem cell clinics in the U S yes. and then you'll also see FDA warnings. So I have to go into the history a little bit and explain why the stem cells you got are so different from what you can get in the United States. Oh, please. Good, I want to please. Yeah. 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 And so the biggest difference is in the United States, you can do what are called autologous stem cells. So autologous means they're from your own body. So you can take them from your bone marrow or you can take them from your fat, but you're not allowed to grow them. That's called culture and expansion where you actually grow the stem cells. And if we're going to be technically correct, which I like to be, is they're technically not even stem cells. They're called committed progenitor cells. What that means is they're already committed to a certain cell lineage, whereas a true stem cell, as most people probably know, has the ability to turn into any type of tissue. Got it. That's called pluripotent. And the most basic form of that is what's called embryonic stem cells, which are totipotent, which means they can turn into anything. But 
I'm, some people may remember in the Bush era, there was a lot of controversy around stem cells. Mm. And the reason for that was because people were proposing that we use embryonic stem cells right. because they're so strong. Mm -hmm. But then obviously there's ethical issues, right? Yeah. It's like, so are these were how are they harvesting it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah so. exactly. And so that never obviously took off. So that kind of set back the stem cell field a little bit. But then there's a lot of bright people and scientists who figured out, hey, wait, there's other sources of stem cells that maybe aren't as strong as embryonic, but still have a lot of great properties. And that's where the fat came in. That's where the bone marrow came in. And then that's where umbilical cord tissue and perinatal fluid and all that stuff that comes after birth came in. Mm -hmm. So in the US, they said, okay, you're allowed to take, you're allowed to take your progenitor cells from your fat and bone marrow, and then you can process it, process it and you can inject it back in. And so this has been done for several years and many clinics offer that. But the problem is there's so much heterogeneity, which means the quality of your stem cells versus a stem cell of a 20 year old is going to be very different. So it's right? only going to be good as, you, as, as good as the ones that you can produce. Exactly. Okay. And after 40, there seems to be a decline in what's called stem cell exhaustion, which is one of the hallmarks of aging, which means the stem cell number and the function of stem cells decreases significantly. So they're probably not even that useful after a certain age. Hmm. Now, what are, the, what are the stem cell treatments approved for? Because when I looked it up and, and read a little bit about it, I think it's just for like certain types of cancers that they treat. So, yes. Yeah, so the, the only... I mean, there are, FDA has a few approved therapies now, but one of them that's been around forever is for like leukemia, which is like a bone marrow transplant. Okay. And that's that's actually when, and that's been around since like the 50s or right. 60s. And that's, that's a much more involved procedure. But the cool thing that we realized is those are hematopoietic stem cells. What you guys got are mesenchymal stem cells. So these are just like embryological terms, but the point is hematopoietic stem cells, you have to have what's called HLA cross-matching. So you have to match. So that's why when you see, are you a match for a bone marrow transplant versus mm. what you guys got were mesenchymal stem cells. And if you guys remember, it's not like we had to be like, oh, are you a match or not? Mm. We, we could just give them to you. And the reason they're safe is because they're immunoprivileged because you don't have to have an exact match. They're not going to cause any sort of rejection. Okay. And that's the beauty of mesenchymal stem cells. So mesenchymal stem cells essentially are, they can be from your fat, your bone marrow, from umbilical cord. And these are all the different sources where we can get them. But in the US, it's currently illegal to take umbilical cord stem cells and inject them into people. That doesn't stop people from doing it. There's lots of clinics doing it, but it's still not FDA approved, which means there's, you're obviously running not only medical legal risk, but then you're also kind of not sure where they're getting their stem cells and what's the quality and all that stuff. And then the other biggest issue in the US is you're not allowed to culture expand them. So the stem cells that people are using in the US are maybe like, let's say 500,000 to a million in terms of dosing. What you guys got was like 200 to 300 million. Wow. So just imagine what's going to be better, just from an intuitive perspective, right? right? Mm -hmm. What's going to be, so in the US, you're basically getting older quality stem cells that are not expanded. And then you go do a stem cell procedure at some doctor's clinic and then you're like, it didn't work. And that's a lot of people's experience. So it's, it's a shame because it's like, it kind of ruins a whole stem cell field mm -hmm. and the possibilities of it because they're not even being done properly in this country. And that's because of regulators are kind of slow in terms of like progressing and keeping up with the science. Because I worked in, like I worked in Dubai for last, uh, last all of winter and over there stem cells, culture expanded stem cells have been legal for like nine years. Same thing in Japan for over 10 years now. But so these countries are already have progressive regulatory frameworks so they can be done safely. But in the U.S., it's still like not allowed. Sorry. Now, now <laughs> the ones that we got were the kind of stem cells that can turn into anything. They're right. pluripotent. pluripotent. So they're not totipotent. They're not embryonic, okay. but they're close to, they're pretty close. Yes. They can turn into many different types of tissue. Okay. So what wouldn't, when wouldn't, wouldn't they be able to turn into since they're not the totipotent? I, uh, I mean, for all intensive purpose, like, so you could do cartilage, muscle, tendon, bone, uh, those are the main ones that they could turn into, but not like you couldn't regenerate like a pancreas from it or oh, like you couldn't regenerate like an organ from it. So, okay. but, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. And so we got, uh, that dose. Now, why are the regulators slow here? Are there risks that they're afraid of? Are they afraid of? It's gotta be money. Is this going to turn into a cancer cell? This is going to feed tumors. Like what, what's the fear? What's no, the because there's good data that the stem cells are actually cleared up by your immune system within a couple of weeks. So they don't actually stay there that long, but the stem cells, what they're doing. So, cause think about why are we putting them intravenously? It's not like we're, we want to grow 
new tissue inside of your body, what they're doing is they're immunomodulating. They're pressing kind of the reset button on your immune system. Okay. So they're reprogramming your immune system from going from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. This is called macrophage phenotyping. And macrophages are basically white blood cells that secrete cytokines that can create pro-inflammatory environments. Right. And a lot of people probably know inflammaging, which is becoming a pro popular oh. term. Chronic inflammation is probably the main driver, one of the main drivers of aging. And so if we can slow down the inflammatory process is going to help with aging. It's going to help with many chronic diseases. And that's what IV stem cells do. Number one, they're, they're doing immunomodulation. So they're reprogramming your immune system. And how do they do that? They go through the system, you give it to us through, through the IV, stem cells are floating around. They go to... They have a homing mechanism okay. through what are called chemokines that get released from the blood vessels that tell them, hey, come here, come fix this problem. So that's why they can help with so many different issues. And they can help with... A lot of them do get trapped in the lungs. Uh, but even though there's a lot of them trapped in the lungs, there's still enough of them being spread out in the vasculature that allows for systemic benefits. So the biggest thing they're doing is your, is your gut... I would say working in your gut and helping to kind of change the environment there. Cause that's where most of your immune system is. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's oh. interesting. Okay. Oh. So you gave us hundreds of millions of plu pluripotent yeah. stem cells, which were harvested from umbilical cord tissue. Okay. And they're from non-vaccinated donors. Just so you guys know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, that's oh my thing, God. Though. We're good. You are requesting that, right? You oh, are requesting that. Yeah. Is that a thing? So, so are people, are people looking for unvaccinated? They are. Yes, it's becoming definitely. more and more popular. Uh, and I wonder why, right? Yeah. Uh, is yeah. it because they're afraid that the, I just watched this clip of this doctor who, Oh, you know who it was? It was the surgeon general of Florida. It was the oh, right. Florida Surgeon yeah. General said, he's like, we need to relax with these mRNA vaccines because we don't know how this is altering your DNA because there's all this DNA hitching rides to with this RNA and it's going to be changing. So he's like, this is the Surgeon General of Florida putting this thing out. It's kind of wild. Well, so you guys got something called follistatin. And, yeah. and that was, it was in a mini circle plasmid, the vector. So vectors are basically a way to carry different genetic material into your body. Right. So the vector we use is called a mini circle, which comes from E. coli, but there's no live bacteria in there. Right. And the beauty of the mini circle plasmid is that it's non-immunogenic, so it doesn't trigger your immune system. Right. And there's no off-site targets. Versus the COVID vaccine, it's a lipid nanoparticle vaccine, uh, so LNP, lipid nanoparticle vector. And what that does, unfortunately, as we now know, is there's offsite targets and it's immunogenic. And you're using that to transmit the DNA, which is the mRNA. Okay. Uh, so okay. the problem is the vector itself wasn't that great to begin with. So that's why there's people, and I've seen it clinically, is where people get weird reactions. You're like, why, why is this happening with the vaccine? Like, this shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's because the lipid nanoparticle is having offsite targets and is stimulating their immune system in some people. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying everyone, yeah. but there's obviously some people who are, have this propensity to be sensitive to it. And so because of that lipid nanoparticle vector, they're getting all these weird side effects that you don't see with other vaccines. Wow. Okay. So, oh. so you gave us the stem cells, the pluripotent ones, and then you said follistatin. So well, let's talk about wait, before we yeah. go into the follistatin, I want to ask more stem cell questions that I'm yeah. curious about because I had such an amazing uh, response from it. Like so amazing that it's like, it makes me want more, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, this is the best my psoriasis has ever been yeah. since I've pretty much have had it. Uh, it's not completely gone, but it is, it has been suppressed so much that of course I have this desire to have more. Is there like an upper limit or what is to stop me from getting no, that's, five times? Well, exactly. And, there, and there's been trials on this. There's There's been uh, clinical trials with inflammatory bowel disease, for example, yeah. IBD, and they put patients into remission, but some of them ended up needing like eight infusions. Okay. But so they just, they were like, is there an upper limit? That was basically the question they so were So is asking. this why you were so confident when- Yeah, like, I was basically like, bro, you were like to, saying, okay. yeah, I was like, if you're able to see this through, we'll get you there. So, okay. So, <laughs> wow. that, so that's why wow. you were so confident. You're like, I know we're going to get this. It's whether we get it in one, two or eight treatments is what it, you're it's, it's once you, and that's where it comes back to like, I think we talked a little bit last time was first principles. Like in physics, first principles is like, okay, what are the laws governing like mechanics and you know, gravity, all that stuff. In, in biology now, they're called fundamental principles or fundamental hallmarks of aging. But aging is the most complex disease, if you think about it. Because if we can cure aging, we can almost treat every other chronic disease because yeah. everything else is less complex than aging. And so there's now there's like 12 hallmarks of aging on the most recent kind of papers. And so those 12 hallmarks kind of govern so many different chronic diseases. So they're like, it's like mitochondrial dysfunction, yes. telomere attrition, chronic inflammation, stem cell exhaustion, 
a, a genomic instability. I could list all of them, but the point is there's 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 all these different hallmarks that govern why your body ages, and that's the same thing with psoriasis and many chronic diseases. It's actually it's it's the immune dysfunction, it's gut dysbiosis, it's chronic inflammation, like it's all these things. And if we're targeting at a cellular level, now we understand that's why we can treat you, and that's why I'm confident with a lot of these treatments because people are like, "How do you know?" I'm like, "Because I know what the underlying cause is." It's mm. it's very different because in medical school. Like, even though I didn't go to medical, it's not like I'm like, you know, that old. But like when I went to medical school, they used to teach us that you can't infer just because you have mechanistic basis doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to work in clinically. Sure. But that was I think that was true 10 years ago. But now the science has evolved so much because of what's called single cell resolution, like spatial imaging, where you can actually see down to a cellular level what's happening. At like with, and you can really understand specific mechanisms and target those with peptides, cell therapy, gene therapy, mm -hmm. that you can say with good certainty that if we target the specific problem with this intervention, because we know exactly what the problem is, it's going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a very different way of thinking because it's it's not like the conventional medicals where it's kind of like very system-based, where it's like, okay, you see a dermatologist, but the dermatologist doesn't know how all the bodies connected in the diff like all those different kind of mechanistic ways. Yeah. The dermatologist just sees a skin problem. And so they give you a cream Yeah, yeah that just yeah. gives you a stare. And that's, that's the way we're taught. So, so is there a difference though with like stem cell that you like l inject in terms of like trying to, to uh, address like any kind of connective tissue damage or, you know, like if you're just, if you're directly like targeting local? localized, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, so it, or is it like, is it the same actual, like, um, stem cells themselves is just the way the the application of it that's different. No, it's yeah. So right now, let's call it first generation stem cells. The so these are culture expanded stem cells mm -hmm. from umbilical cord tissue. So we can we can use them into like tendon tears, muscle tears, and we can do direct injections and we can regenerate tissue. That that works great. That's something we've been doing for like many years, even with just like uh, plasma injections mm -hmm. that it can help. Uh, but now, second generation is where you're going to get more specific cell lines to repair specific tissue. Mm. So, so second generation is what's called the Yamanaka stem cells. So Yamanaka was a Nobel Prize guy in, you know, 10 years ago who figured out cellular reprogramming. So basically he's like, okay, if, if you overexpress these different transcription factors, you can basically take any somatic cell in your body. So I could take a muscle cell or a skin cell in your body. And Make I can it turn, a heart yeah, cell or something else. Yeah, exactly. And so hmm. you're base and well, reprogram it first into a baby stem cell, which is almost like embryonic in state. And then you can differentiate it into a heart cell or right. differentiate it into a pink a beta islet cell. I remember when this happened, it was big news. Yeah. But so basically, if you think about it, you're de-aging the cell, number one. And number two, you're giving it the potential to differentiate into whatever cell line you want. Hmm. So for example, some of the research we're doing now. So those are called induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, or it, for people to remember, I think it's just Yamanaka, let's just call it Yamanaka stem cells, mm -hmm. it's easier to remember. So the, let's say you take a Yamanaka stem cell, and now what we're going to do, for example, is we're going to differentiate them into beta islet cells, and then we're going to transplant them into the pancreas for diabetes. So that's one of the uh, trials we're, we're going to be hmm. doing later this year. So when I hear this, my, the you know if, if I were to be like fearful or whatever, I always think like, okay, well, um, what if you produce a cell that won't stop replicating? Is there a yeah, fear so, of that? Yeah, there is. And mm -hmm. that's exactly with iPSCs because the Yamanaka stem cells, the problem is because they're like embryonic, they can grow into tumors or teratomas because right. they're too strong. They have too much stemness. And that's why the cells you guys got are great because they have a finite ability to... How do they do that? How do they make it finite? Because they're mesenchymal in origin. So it's a different cell origin, lineage, different lineage. So they so can't go in that they direction. They can't they don't go in that direction. Whereas Yamanaka stem cells can go in that direction. So the technology we have, it, there's a gene edit on that technology. So this is, this is really cool. It's called synthetic biology. It's basically where you can engineer these cells and you can gene edit them and manipulate them the, kind of the way you want. And so these gene edits are done in a way to prevent tumors or uncontrolled proliferation. So that's that's the wow. technology we have. So it's an anti-cancer almost. Wow. It, yeah, it won't cause cancer. Wow. So iPSC, but that's the risk with Yamanaka stem cells. And that's why I would caution people to go, because there's still probably a 1% chance that they could turn into tumors without that gene edit. But that the gene edit, it's a it's a tech, it's a company uh, that has a patent on it, and we're working they're working exclusively with us to develop different cell lines. Yeah. Okay. So that's the other question I was going to ask. So yeah, it's like you know I know you, I like you, I trust you. Like, where do you get your stem cells? Like, where are you getting these <laughs> supplies? Are they are they from the same places that the the, the American produce you know providers are? No, we have our own uh, manufacturing facility in Mexico for. Mm -hmm. 
for the ones you guys got. And so we control the way stem cells are harvested, obviously tested, all that stuff. There's a lot of testing done. But the biggest thing I think to understand is how you grow the stem cells. Because if you don't grow them the right way, it's called replicative stress, like how many passages you do. So how many times you change them from one cell culture flask to another. Oh. If you if you take them too many times, it, it causes stress to the DNA. And then the cell, stem cells can actually be harmful. And a lot of clinics are using cell passages, like six passages, eight passages, some are using 10. We limit ours to three. So, and that's something I learned in Asia and Japan. That's what they, that's what they do over there. And I was like, how come? And they, they obviously just explain. And so the passages is very important. As far as I know, we're the only ones on this side of the world doing that. And so we're limiting the passages and that allows for higher cells viability. <laughs> So anytime a market like this emerges, also uh, out comes all the charlatans and the people. So how does the average consumer know? And, and of course, what they do, the charlatans will do is they'll they'll find somebody reputable like you, use the information science you talk about. Yeah. And we have under, the same stuff. Cheaper. Same, yeah, same <laughs> yeah, stuff yeah. for 50% <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, you see that all the time. Yeah, so yeah. explain to me um, what are they doing that's probably shady to try to make that happen and, and how hard and difficult is it for the person who's seeking this out to know. It's really hard. It's really hard because even a lot of doctors and celebrities, I've had people who like have pretty much, you know, unlimited money and resources and have access to any doctor in the world and they've gotten tricked. Oh, wow. So wow. if they've gotten tricked, how is the average consumer going to figure it out? And I think, I think the biggest thing I would say is if you're going to get these procedures done right now, mm -hmm. make sure the person you're going to is doing some sort of active research. Like they're not just doing this because if they're only doing this, they're, they're clearly just interested in the money mm -hmm. and the business model. Right. Because right now this is still a very new field and you need to be actively engaged in the research side to really understand the clinical translation side. So like I'm doing multiple clinical trials like in Canada and other places. And so I'm very engaged on the research side, which allows me to kind of liaison with all these amazing scientists from around the world. And I learn from them and then I can learn from them and translate it clinically. And I can be like, okay, this is how we can improve our manufacturing process. This is what's down, coming down the pipeline and just keep trying to improve. Whereas a lot of these stem cell clinics like in Panama and other places, they've kind of just been doing the same shit for like 10 years mm. and they don't, they're not really interested in innovating and they're not really interested they're in like making money. They're off. just making money. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. What is it? So what are they? So you said in, Ch in Japan, they've been doing this now for almost a decade. Yeah. What are they doing them in Japan for? What are the, 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 the applications? So by far the most common is definitely anti-aging, which is similar to what you got, the IV stuff, uh, because that's really popular in the Asian community. Now it's, it's, grow it's a growing trend. Um, uh, but then cancer is another one. So they're using different types of cell therapies for cancer. So these aren't mesenchymal stem cells, but they're called natural killer cells and dendritic cells, which are part of your innate immune system. Mm -hmm. So natural killer cells, as the name suggests, they're killers. They, they help to kill cancer. Yeah. And then dendritic cells are cells in your immune system that help to present these cancer cells to the natural killers to help your immune system to fight the cancer. So what happens with cancer is it becomes immunoevasive. That's one of the hallmarks of it, yeah. meaning your immune system can't recognize it and it doesn't, it can't, it can't do what it's supposed to be able to do, which is kill these aberrant cells. And so this just gives your body kind of like the armor and the mechanisms to kind of fight it off. Are they doing this like an adjuvant therapy to like chemo? Yeah, exactly. Okay. A lot of times it works in conjunction, or a lot of the patients have tried everything and they're still like looking for last options. And I've had I've and I've and, and I saw it in Japan firsthand. Like they had stage four like pancreatic cancer patients who are still alive 10 years later because they underwent went the immunotherapy with natural killer cells and dendritic cells. So after that, I was like, holy crap, there's obviously something to this. Wow. Uh, wow. So, so yeah. What do people typically notice when they, when they do this stem cell treatment uh, for, let's say, longevity or, or anti-aging? I mean, I'll talk about, we'll talk about our experience. Yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'm curious to yeah. hear what you guys have to say. But, but what, do, what do people normally report? Yeah, in, in general, the biggest thing is recovery, sleep, energy. I would say like those, those are like, like vitality, things. vitality. Exactly. Sometimes it is, it's obviously very subjective in that sense, but I, I, if you measure HRV, for example, we'll see people after IV stem cells, their HRV will improve quite dramatically. Mm. Uh, so I think just the recovery aspect of your body gets mm. a lot better. Uh, and then depending on how chronically inflamed you are, some people like some people actually feel the effects of aging, right? They're, they're like, I'm achy, I'm stiff. I wake up, I'm yeah. kind of slow. And then after doing this, this, stuff they're like man i feel like 10 15 years younger so what does that mean that yeah they usually means they're just like it's easy they're not as achy they have more energy they can they can walk faster like all mm -hmm. these cool things so i i remember because i did i've obviously done it for my parents and i did it for my dad and then my my father-in-law was like 
because I hadn't done it for him yet. And he's like, and then he saw my dad walking. He's like, why is he walking so fast? And he's like, what did you do for him? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, I want that. So that's like, very cool. <laughs> I wish we would, you know, my only regret was that we didn't go do our biological age. Yeah. First. We just did that recently. Yeah. yeah. And I'm yeah. like, damn no, no, it. That would still be, I would still be, because the, the epigenetic changes for the biological age take three months. Oh, so you guys, it wouldn't have affected. Wait, when did we go? When did we come see you? December. Okay, so we're okay then. Yeah, yeah. so we can do oh, another one. Oh, in like six wait a minute. So yeah. hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Okay. So hold on. When do we feel the full effects then of the stem cells? Is it three yeah. months later? Four to six months. Yeah. Wow. So oh, what we're feeling we now? It's just, oh, just like early. Yeah, yeah. We're not even noticing much. I mean, the follistatin would have kicked in. Yes. But yeah, the that. stem cells fully kick in around four to six months for recovery and sleep and all. That really? Stuff. Okay. Yeah. But some people may notice it. Like he noticed it pretty early, right? Which was, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a big range. So, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about what we all experienced so far. Cause this is only Wait, been, one last, one it's last, only been a month. one last clip. So <laughs> yes. that, Cause I, I want to stay with the thing that I was asking about, like, you know, doing it all the time. And I know you can't share specific patients, but, uh, I would imagine if I was uber wealthy, I would be hooked up to this fucker every month with you. Yeah, right. I, I have. Uh, I mean, I can talk about Tony Robbins because we posted online. Like Tony Robbins does IV exosomes every month, um, wow. and then wow. he does the stem cells every six months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. I feel like yeah, yeah, but he's also worth five hundred million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, these are not cheap. <laughs> <too. These laughs> I mean, so what I'm so what I'm so fascinated with then is you telling me that yes, more more is better type of deal. Yes, there's people not doing this. Is like let's fast forward 15 years from now. Like where's exactly, and yeah. we're gonna be able to see like my vision for this is you eventually you can go to your like even general practitioner and be like just you go every two years as part of your you know annuals and you get these gene and cell therapies done and they're covered by insurance ideally because they're slowing because their aging is a chronic disease and it's being defined as such now and if we can treat aging in a meaningful way you're going to prevent so many other chronic diseases wow. but then that's not necessarily good for the system right because you're keeping people healthy right so, yeah so they're going to fight it but okay so you're, <laughs> you're of, of yeah. everybody i've ever talked to you you yeah. have to have the most experienced knowledge hands-on stuff with with anti-aging and there's a lots of stuff online and people touting oh we're going to live to 130 you know like What's your belief on like our generation and the generation coming back? Like what the, what stem cell therapy is going to do for us as far as a species like living longer? Well, because of the cellular reprogramming, it's it's real is really possible that we can reprogram your cells to a very previous like DH state, and that's something that can happen. I think in our lifetime. So I'm not saying we're going to live forever, but I think we could definitely push the boundaries well into our hundreds where we're living a high quality of life. Yeah. Meaning we have loss of energy, we have loss of strength, vitality, even in our hundreds. Wow. So that's wow. what I see. That's Interesting. That, right. Just with the cool. current therapies, How, I think with the- Right, right. You know, that's not even saying where does it there. evolve in 10 exactly. years? Exactly. Because imagine, imagine you can come, this is what I, I think would be the craziest thing. We can basically sell you, re, re, reprogram all your old cells and make them all young again. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. How often do you get stem cells? <laughs> I do them every year. Yeah, so every year you just hook yourself up. Yeah. Oh. And then I do the IV exosomes every six months, which were included in your guys' stem now, cells. Now, what's well. exosomes? What are so those? exosomes are, so if I always say, if you have chicken soup, the chicken, the meat part is the stem cells and the broth is the exosomes. So it's kind of the broth that the stem cells grow in. So they don't, oh. there's no cells in there, but they have all the cytokines, all the growth factors and anti-inflammatory signals. Oh. Okay. So because there's no cells, they're not going to last as long because the cells are what signal to your immune system to okay. have that reprogramming effect, but they still have a anti-inflammatory effect and de-aging mm. effect. And if you put them in com combination with the stem cells, it'll there's make synergistic. The exactly. Yeah. There's a, there's yeah. a synergy. Now, is there a reason to ever do one without the other? Yeah. Sometimes we do. I, I mean, it's mainly price to be honest, but oh. exosomes are cheaper. So oh. I would say if some people can't, you know, they can't, if they can only afford one thing, then some, we'll just do the exosomes often. Ah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Got it. All right. You want to talk about what you, what yeah, you felt? Yeah, go ahead. Well, so, no, I mean, I think you should start because yours was the most profound so far. Yeah. And I didn't even know that we didn't feel the full effect. Definitely the that's most crazy. visible. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah I, mean, well, I mean, we all see it because he's got, he's got, I mean, his, his, uh, psoriasis, psoriasis is always, I mean, it's obvious. Yeah. And thanks. he's been showing us every day and it's like, whoa, dude, yeah, that I mean, is weird. I mean, I, 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 I noticed, uh, within 48 hours. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it was. That means it, your body was probably in an acutely flamed, inflamed setting. Yeah, it was. It was. It, so I got like really excited. I was like, "Oh my god, this is for sure going." If he's like, you know, because it was starting to go. Yeah. I definitely feel like I'm. I've. I've. The the results slowed down. Like they were like it felt like week over week. I'm like, oh my god, this is just happening. It's going away. It's going away. It's going away. 
And now I feel like, and, and there's like spots, like I have five spots that are gone. That are just, they were there, now they're gone. Really? And then my bad, sp oh yeah, yeah. No, like I had spots on my head that yeah. were, were super bad. Those are the ones on his legs. At yeah. All. And, yeah. The, and, the, and even like the spot on my shin is almost complete. Like you, you could actually only tell because the coloration of my skin is yeah. different. Like it's yeah. like, that's yeah, the it's one not you raised. keep showing It doesn't us. look raised anymore. Yeah. It's not is, raised at yeah. all. It's it's just like a lighter colored. And I bet you if I actually were that's to That's the one that you week, always show us. You always are showing us that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one that I, I've noticed the one on my rib cage, which is my my worst site, uh, again is completely shrunk down, has been suppressed. It's not as raised at all, um, but it's. It, I feel like it's kind of staying right mm -hmm. right there, which is what I was when I, as soon as he walked in, I'm like, I want to do it again. <laughs> I, I want to like, see the the, the leap <laughs> from that. So yeah, so of course for out of us. I had like a visual thing, yeah. right? So it's much easier because I know like vitality could be so subjective. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh yeah, am I sleeping better? Do I have more energy? Yeah, and so, right. but I can definitely uh, attest to, I notice all those things too. Like I I feel like my, my skin looks younger. I feel like sleep is better. I just feel like I have more consistent energy through the day. But of course I was there for the psoriasis. And so, and that of all the interventions that mm. I've tried, nothing has progressed it this well this fast um and then the other thing that i was telling you off air that i find really interesting too is like not only is it making it uh, it better visually but one of the biggest challenges and anybody who has psoriasis can attest to this is like just not itching it oh right yeah, yeah and of course every dermatologist would say don't itch it try not to do that because then you're just scabbing it over and you're making it worse but uh anybody who's had this will tell you like good luck yeah you know good you, if you're laying in bed and your psoriasis itches you ain't falling asleep like yeah. it's it right. will it'll drive you crazy and like i've had moments where i'm like i'm trying to discipline myself from not scratching and i'm like it's all around it i'm like i'm like trying yeah. not to touch it but i'm like scratching the rest of my body hoping it'll give me some relief and it never does until you finally do what this has done is it's it's eliminated that like i don't even have a a, a desire to itch it which that makes me go like oh wow that's that, that means something internally has got to be happening that is not allowing it to flare up nearly as bad so not only is it going away but whatever mechanism was causing me to flare and then want to scratch because i used to tell the guys that I would know when I ate something that was an offender because within one hour I would have to itch. Mm. So like I could be going the day, like let's say I'm fasted, which I would do this too, where I would fast every once in a while for a, a day and obviously I'm good. And then I would start to introduce foods. And as long as I chose certain foods, I would be good. And then I would eat something that I knew that was a potential offender. And then like clockwork within 45 minutes to an hour, I'm like wanting to itch where I have not been perfect at all with my diet since we've done this. And I don't have that at all, which is fascinating. And that that to me is one of the take home messages. It's building resiliency in your body because the reality is we have something like 86,000 86, toxins in our environment now. And so the amount of toxins that we're exposed to on a daily basis is only increasing and it's not going to change. Let's be honest, yeah. the food supply, you guys have talked about this at length, right? The food, the, you know, the environment, yeah, plastics, chemicals, plastics myco yeah. mycotoxins like mold. So how do you build your body to be able to put up and be, have resiliency to deal with all this? Because a lot of people are just like, they're almost so fragile that they can't, they're like, they have to eat such a small limited number of foods. They have to right. be so careful about how they live their life. And I'm like, man, you're not even like living life then anymore at that point. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, how do, and that's why for me as a minimalist and also as like someone who kind of went, had a sensitive, some sensitivities before too, I was like, I, I want to live like an, as close to normal life as I can. It's like, what's going to have the most impact on my body. It's going to be this type of stuff where it's actually reprogramming your body. Yeah. Right. And that's kind of the idea with like, the transplanting the new gut, the gut bacteria too, yeah. right? Instead of a probiotic, because problem with probiotics is they're transitory. They don't they don't actually repopulate no. and change mm -hmm. your gut long term. So that's they why influence your microbiome, but they don't they right. don't populate. No, yeah. and so that's why you have to transplant new gut bacteria. Is, that's uh, a gut transplant. You do that too. Yeah, we're we're gonna have it ready. We have a third party, but we're manufacturing our own. How does that? That's work? a good follow. It's just a pill. It's just a. It's just. It's, How does it transplant versus like why would why does that transplant and other probiotic because pills they come don't? from. Poop. Human. <laughs> so it's human specifically poop. human uh, uh, bacteria. I've read all those studies, yeah. Yeah, but now it's actually something that's an option. Right? Yeah, no, it's a, it's and the, the issue was always accessibility because you had to go to like, there's maybe like there only a few clinics in the world and you had to do it through colonoscopy and like, it's like how many people are really going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And now with the new technology, you can lipophilize them. So basically like dry freeze them and then you can you can store it indefinitely as shelf stable and then you just take, it's like a two week course that we're going to have that's going to be available. Now, how are you not do we get, get to opt in on like some we super 
former athlete or you know, yeah no like so there's Jackson that's actually skills. very interesting there was um, <laughs> there, some dude with gold poop you know? no no there was a there was a, a I, mean, I want Bo Jackson that's shit. yeah yeah saying, man. no no so that's I actually that's in our pipeline so our first generation FMT is so it's called fecal microbial transplant we're gonna come up with a better name because I think that'll like you know scare people we'll probably call it like gut renewal or something yeah yeah you know but it's it's funny you said that because there was a there was a Taiwanese like Olympic weightlifter champion and she was she happened to also be a microbiologist so and PhD scientist so she like I'm just like who are these superhumans but <laughs> like, yeah, right. uh, but basically so uh, she she was like I want to test my like poop and microbiome and then they found that she had this ex like this unique strain and they call it now it's published literature it's called OL Olympic bifidobacterium 01 like OLP 01 is what they call it and basically when you transplant that into other people it increases cardiovascular fitness what wow. like significantly what? So, and this is published data out there. there so we're, we're going to make an athletic package where you do shut FMT up. where you do FMT <laughs> shut your face yeah and follow statin together and you increase strength and cardiovascular bro fitness. you know what's going to happen <laughs> they're going to have oh, pictures God. of Sign the up. athletes they got the poop from <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you're going to look at the bottom and be like oh what <laughs> yeah. Yeah, three yeah. time Mr. Olympia they're I'll take that one <laughs> over looking back like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. picture him on the toilet yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow that dude looks awesome I want his poop how do you not get pathogens right because everybody knows you don't eat poop yeah no <laughs> no, yeah, no. There's a whole process. My so Dr. Caroline Ganabis, she's our human microbiome scientist. So she has a whole IP, like proprietary yeah. process on how to donor select, how to capsulize, how to how to store them, everything like A to Z in terms of manufacturing. The donor selection cracks me up. So there's literally people yeah. <laughs> who work for these companies. Yeah, they do full time poop donation. There are people in the US who are doing that now. <laughs> wow. They get paid pretty decent. They get I think they get make like six figures. <laughs> what? Wow. Uh, so many opportunities out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I know. We're I flushing money job. down the toilet, guys. I got a job for it. <laughs> That's insane. Okay, so back to Adam. Um so he was also you also gave him a peptide called GHK. Yeah, well, but was... why we're talking about mine and the psoriasis for the audience so they can hear you, because you've explained to me multiple times and I don't even want to try it and attempt, but explain the mechanism that's happening specifically for me in psoriasis, right? I have an autoimmune, it's attacking my body, you put these stem cells in me, what is happening that's causing it to, to get better? Why might it kind of plateau and why I might need more? Like kind of explain what, what what's happening. Yeah, so autoimmunity between different autoimmune conditions, there's probably more similarities and there is differences. And I think that's where a lot of people get kind of choked up is like they go to their rheumatologist or they go to their specialist and then they're treating because they're they're so siloed right yeah. they're kind of like it depends on what specialist you go to like for multiple sclerosis you'll go to a neurologist for psoriasis you'll go to a dermatologist for like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis you'll go to a rheumatologist but the reality is all these different autoimmune dis con conditions actually have a lot of similarities mm. so and that's what we're trying to treat and that's why a lot of people are like how are you treating all these different conditions it's not because it's not because i'm like you know, I have the knowledge set of all these different specialists is because I'm thinking differently from them. And and what we're looking at is, okay, you have immune dysfunction. So where is this immune dysfunction coming from? The two biggest things are the thymus gland and then the gut. So because the gut is where most of your immune system is stored. And then the thymus gland is kind of where your immune system goes to get trained. So that's where the T cells learn how to hmm. target. And the, but there's something called T regulatory cells, T reg. And so T reg cells are so important in your body for maintaining what's called immunotolerance or immunohomeostasis, let's call it, hmm. to prevent your body from attacking itself. Hmm. And so what happens is T regs become dysfunctional in autoimmune conditions. And then they start becoming, obviously, this, you start getting other kind of things depending on what vulnerabilities and genetics you have. Like for you, you obviously develop psoriasis, but other people may develop lupus. And so... And one of the really interesting things now we we in the, in the just in the past two years and have come out is muscle is very protective for autoimmunity because yeah. of T reg cells. Yeah. So it upregulates T reg cells and their mm -hmm. function. So that's part of the reason why putting on muscle and not just training cardio is so important for patients with autoimmune conditions. But a lot of times autoimmune condition patients are in this kind of vicious cycle where they don't have energy. They know, you know, they can't because they're in pain or yeah. whatever. And they lose muscle, it gets worse. Exactly. Yeah. They're stuck. And that's what we do. We help to break them out of that cycle. And then it's so life-changing for them. So in your case, the reason why it worked and the reason why it's helping is because it's reducing inflammation in the gut, it's reducing inflammation in the thymus, it's like promoting your immune system to work better. Yeah. And so that's why you're reducing this inf chronic inflammation. And then we add those bioregulators on those peptides to promote function of the thymus gland. That's why you're on thymus and alpha one and all that other stuff to kind of work synergistically. And like the last kind of missing piece is the actual microbes. And that's why transplanting new gut bacteria will be great for you because you're basically helping to replenish the gut bacteria. Because the gut really has like two really broad 
issues. One is le like leaky gut or chronic yeah. inflammation, intestinal permeability. And then the other is dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the bacteria. They're both connected, right? So, exactly. And so we're, the IV stem cells is treating one, but uh, transplanting the new gut bacteria is kind of the other piece. Wow. Mm. So I, I read, uh, read something that said that 60% um, of people that suffer from autoimmune disorders also uh, had childhood trauma. Yeah. Do you think that's just correlation or do you think there's something there? No, I, I, so we're doing this procedure called the vagus nerve and we're doing it for so many patients with chronic pain, autoimmune conditions. It started out, so. So I'll explain give, the vagus yeah, nerve Yeah, I'll give first. a little bit of history yeah. of it because, so there's something called a stellate ganglion block that's been around for maybe 20 years. A stellate ganglion block has been done by many doctors and it's essentially an injection into the stellate ganglion in, in the neck area, which feeds into your sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of your fight or flight. Right. So if you're, if you're fighting- and this is for PTSD people, they've been doing this. Exactly. Yeah. So it's called an SGB block. It's been around for a long time. And so what we did was we were like, okay, we're, that's great, but is there something we can do that would help this to last longer? And so there's a doctor, uh, Dr. Jonathan Koo, who I, I work with in the States and Dr. Matt Cook, who kind of were looking at vagus nerve. And so that's where I learned that, hey, if you intervene on the vagus nerve and the stellate ganglion together, now you're not only innervating on the sympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve feeds into the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic is relax or digest. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the and, and you know the opposite of the sympathetic. And a lot of people in modern day, especially with trauma, are in sympathetic overdrive. Right. So they're in this hyper aroused mm -hmm. state. They're irritable. They're anxious. Some of them can't, you know, obviously sleep issues, all sorts of stuff. And and then you can only imagine what effect that has on your body over years. If right. you're in, the, in this hyper aroused state, what's that going to do to your immune system. And we know now that the nervous system and the immune system are connected. And so what we do, instead of just injecting anesthetic, which just suppresses your sympathetic tone for three months, which is great. I mean, it's still helpful, but it's pretty temporary. So what we do is we inject peptides and exosomes into the vagus nerve. So that helps to modulate or restore vagus nerve dysfunction and helps your parasympathetic relaxation system. And then we inject peptides and anesthetic into the stellate ganglion. So that helps to not only suppress it, but has a long-term reprogramming effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and the vagus nerve is basically the highway between the brain and the gut. Yeah. That's yeah. how it's communicating. Yes, exactly. So that's, that's why I've had patients with like gastroparesis, chronic gut issues, all sorts of stuff get better with the vagal nerve. The most interesting, I mean, aside from like anxiety and trauma, I've had patients like with chronic pain after the vagus nerve injection you're like my pain's gone i'm like really yeah. that, like if that wasn't the reason so, i was doing it it's just it's so interesting though there's obviously this connection between inflammation and and your and the vagus it's nerve. so yeah. weird that you brought this up because i literally have been reading about polyvagal theory uh because i because i have these gut issues that just keep popping up and i'll treat them they'll go away and they just keep popping up and i'm reading about polyvagal theory and how the vagus nerve is affecting all that because there's rest digest there's fight or flight but there's also something called freeze and fawn that's the other one that they've identified which some people when they when they're in that state, they don't fight or flight. They freeze. They just in that they don't do anything. Yeah, you know, right. And I've had many. I've had many patients with like panic attacks. I think we're talking about like I had a pro golfer. Uh, his name is Matt Wolf. He wrote a, he 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 wrote us a review so I can talk about him. But he's uh he has one of the fastest golf swings in the world, and he was having performance anxiety when he was playing away games. And so we did the vagal vagus nerve treatment for him, and now he's playing like the best golf he's played in years. Oh, <laughs> it's wow. So cool because it's, it's just you're 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 in a more you're less aroused arousable, <laughs> yeah. right? And so I, I had it done on myself. I'm not like a super anxious person, but I have a lot of stress in my life, just like everyone does. And so yeah. it just, it kind of chills you out a little bit. That's why, I mean, that's why I did it for my wife too, chill her out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, honey, do this so, yeah. so let me ask you this. Okay, so here's my questions with that. If you did the treatment with the vagus nerve, and you're not as aroused. Does that mean you're not going to be able to get as aroused? Like I can't go lift weights heavy. I can't get. No, angry. no, exactly. Because it's okay. And you guys know this because you guys are so familiar with peptides. Peptides only kind of work where they need to and what they need. They, and same thing with exosomes. It's all about they're not going to do anything if there's nothing to it's do. It's not forcing. It's something. It's not forcing yeah. something exactly. And so that's why the beauty. That's why I like this whole regenerative medicine field yeah. because it's all about kind of reprogramming or rebooting or trying to take the body into a previous state. Wow. Right. And that's, that's kind of the whole idea what, of what we're now, trying to do. Now what's the, what peptide would you inject into the So I use, nerve? um, I use, so I use BPC, uh, 157, yeah. uh, GHK, uh, and then also TB4 or TB500. Oh, so wow. So those are mixed because it's, they're, they have, because they kind of have synergistic effects in terms of cellular, uh, signaling because like they work different pathways and yeah. work together. They have a, it's a really nice way to kind of restore function to dysfunctional nerves and to dysfunctional, okay. uh, soft tissue tendons. So well. I was using uh, BPC-157 and uh, thymus and beta-4 
Um, but just systemically, I didn't inject it in anywhere specifically, just yeah. under the skin. And I got leaner and stronger and had a different quality to the way my body looked. It just, it took a little time, but I started to notice that I just, like everything looked a little different and, and felt Yeah, better. because- and I kept telling these guys, like, this is wild. Well, yeah. And as you get older, because the peptides are naturally occurring in your body and a lot of them, as you get older, decrease. And that's why the statin, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second, what we did with the gene therapy is it's basically just a delivery mechanism to restore your statin levels back to like when you were like 18. And that's all it's doing. It's a naturally occurring wow. thing in your body. And so we're going to make different gene therapy products. We're going to make one for BPC. We're going to make one for GHK. We're going to make one for DP4. We're doing all of that. We're going to do all of them. So wow. that way, that way you don't have to inject yourself every day. You just do one yeah. injection. You're good. For Fun you. fact on Thymosin Alpha, which you talked about that you, you gave a little bit to Adam, they put, they, they blocked the production of that during COVID. I don't know if anybody knew that. <laughs> Did you know Awesome. That? The one thing that has been shown to be super effective in Russia, <laughs> Thymolin and Thymosin Alpha 1. Yeah. You can and then all treat, of a sudden you couldn't get it. They of stopped course you could. It. Interesting. Yeah, and, that's, uh, and you know, there was over, so I, I talked about this during COVID was there was over 40 randomized control trials on like intravenous stem cells and exosomes for COVID. Yet not one media outlet ever talked about stem cells or exosomes to treat COVID. Like not only long COVID, but for uh, acute COVID in the hospital, you could help so many people. And exosomes are pretty inexpensive to manufacture and they could scale those, especially if the government was to subsidize it. Instead, but, we put them on ventilators. Wow. It's so, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's, it's All right. really. All right. So let me, so, uh, so the other thing too, Adam was using GHK. That's another peptide that he's using. Yeah. And GHK that, is no, technically a bioregulator as well. So it, it is. Cause it, 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 it uh, bioregulators are basically something that help to improve organ function too. Okay. So they're not just acting on like signals in the, in, in, they're actually helping with the organ function. Now too. GHK helps with the regeneration process of like the skin, exactly, and the hair yeah. follicles and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Is that what's happening with that? Okay. <laughs> and what's, what is it? Isn't that, isn't that in the cream and then also in the injectable? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Copper peptide is, it, I mean, a lot of top, a lot of, uh, uh, companies now, cosmetic companies are using copper peptide in their, but the problem is the concentration is always so low. So uh, I was using some on my head <laughs> for hair growth because supposedly it grows, grows and it made my hair darker. Interesting. Yeah. So I don't know if it's because of the copper or I don't know what the deal is, but I noticed my hair was getting darker as yeah. a result. So I don't know. I'm asking you. <laughs> Am I tripping or is something else going on? No, no. I, I mean, uh, th the reason for graying hair, they, they sometimes it's a lot like you need more copper. So yeah, yeah, thinking. exactly. And then they, they've 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 learned that this the cellular basis for it has to do with uh, stem cells becoming in a, a senescent. So certain stem cells actually become senescent, and oh. then they, they and then they're the ones responsible for melanin production, and then that's why your hair starts to gray. Oh, so wow. if you can make those stem cells not be senescent anymore, then you can get rid of gray hair. So that's that's one of the things where one of the mm. cell lines we're working on are the, you know that Yamanaka stem cell technology yeah. I was telling you about. So we're going to differentiate them into hair dermal papillae cells. So basically, the the, the progenitor cells are going to regrow new hair follicles. So, so we're going to have hair IPS for hair loss. Yeah. So we, so yeah. I'm, I'm actually, that's a project where we're working Now, would on. you have to inject that locally? Like someone's Yeah, you, but you would inject it just into the scalp and then you could regrow uh, new hair. Wild. Okay. Uh, Look at Adam. He's so excited. Right? <laughs> Fix his psoriasis. So much potential. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I noticed from everything. I, I, I noticed a lot of my skin, my skin seemed to feel a lot. It just felt more youthful. And my wife was, has been even saying, she's like, man, your skin. I, I didn't have bad skin before. She always commented on my skin. But it looked a lot better. And then I noticed just, I would say, nothing profound, but like a consistent 10 to 15% improvement in overall energy uh, that I just have been feeling. I'm just yeah. feeling more, uh, j just almost like I was like in my early 30s, it kind of felt like, where I just got a little bit more energy throughout the day. It was a big thing. But I had no major issues like Adam, so... Nothing yeah, how's your how's your strength? Has have you seen changes in that yet? You know, I haven't been able to push myself super hard, but generally speaking, um, I am stronger, like I would be if I was more on point. So I know how strong I can be when I'm hitting on all cylinders, and I know where my strength is when I'm under a lot of stress or whatever, like I have been. And my strength is like it is when I'm right running right. on all cylinders, even though right now I'm going through tremendous stress in my life. So that's something that I, I thought, I thought what I felt was even is, was just as profound in this also the neural drive. You said, yeah, what's, yes, what's interesting, yes, what was yes. interesting for yes. me is, so I'm like the, probably the opposite of Sal right now. Like he's a uh, super consistent. He's always really, really consistent. And as long as I've known, I've never seen him miss a week of working out where I've had many bouts of, since we've been on this podcast of weeks of not working out at all. And so I've been very inconsistent about my training 
And, but I've been doing this for so long. I know what it feels like when I get back to being consistent, right? And I know those first few workouts, what a struggle it is and the recovery on it, how weak I feel. Even like I, uh, workouts will even make me feel a little lightheaded and nauseous when you first start at the very beginning of getting back into your, your, that was all like gone, which was really interesting to me. It's like what I know, what a, a kind of like the first workout of getting back into the swing of things was going to feel like. I felt like amazing. I felt like I'd already been working out for like four weeks consistently. So that was really profound and interesting. And then I come running in here after a day that I would, like the first day that I did like incline bench press. Again, a movement I've done a, a million times. One of the things I've never been good at, um, well, I've never been good at leg drive with the bench press. Mm. Just never been able to, like what they say, connect from your feet all the way up. As, and, I, and I've practiced the technique a thousand times and just have never felt like, oh, I'm getting extra strength from my legs for the first time in my life. And it was literally the first set. I just get out of there and I'm not even like trying any hard. I'm not even going like, oh, this is supposed to help this. I just do it. I'm like, whoa, I can feel... Like I'm connected to my yeah. feet all the way down. And then I came out to him. I was like, hey, did Dr. Khan say this was supposed to do something with neural drive or something like that? And, I, and then I shared with him like, dude, this is what I feel. And I've never felt that before. Yeah. I was really fascinated by that. Like that's was interesting. Yeah. Me. The neurological drive. That's why a lot of. And that's the false statin. Yeah. That's saying. the false okay. status. So the mm -hmm. uh, hockey players, uh, football players, and then uh, Devin Lariat, probably the guy who benefited the most from arm that. Arm wrestle, right? Arm, world champion arm wrestler. Yeah. And he actually made a post. He, th he thanked me on stage when he won. He's like, thank you, Dr. Khan. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> Which was, I was like, okay, wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> because he, because he, uh, he won number one again because, and he's 48. Um, and he said the follow stat and made him feel like he was 20 years younger. Yeah, so yeah. that's, and so that that's was what like, it reminded he just said, me of working out when I was <laughs> right. like 17, yeah. 18 years old. Yeah. It's because like that neurological firing and that that's what I, that's my favorite part too. Cause I'm like, you know, I'm stressed, I'm traveling, I'm doing a lot of things. And like, it's cool that I can just jump into a gym and not feel like, you know, I've been out of here for like weeks or something. It's different that, than like a, a testosterone. No, exactly. It, yeah, know, yeah. Kind of yeah, it's nothing like that. Drive. Yeah, it was like, for me, it was more, I felt kind of normal in terms of like, just a little more energetic, I would say. But, you know, once I got into actually exercising, it was like, this is weird. I feel like I could do probably like five more reps. We were right, normally exactly, right here, yeah. I would stop. And it just became one of those things where I was experimenting with other exercises. It was the same across the board. It was at least like a 10 to 20 pound increase on, on most of the lifts I just normally Which just, is a I, lot for an experienced lifter, right? Yeah. That's yeah. A, oh, that's huge. So false statin is, uh, that is inversely related with myostatin. That's right, yeah. So that's the main, that's, is that the main mechanism of action? It's reducing your myostatin, which is a muscle growth limiter. Yes. Uh, okay. That That's the main for uh, mechanistic energy, I mean, strength benefits. Okay. Uh, but- so that and that's why the bodybuilding community knows about Falstad and like they've heard a lot of them have been experimenting with it yes. and trying it for years and years. But the problem with the peptide that you order off wherever it's it's just a peptide. It's not a gene therapy. And so the half life of Falstad is ninety minutes. You have to inject it like three times a day or, or whatever. like well like twenty times a day, yeah, <laughs> like ten yeah. times a day and wake up in the middle of the night and like for yeah. for you to replicate what the gene therapy is doing, which is huh. keeping your Falstad levels at steady level. And now yours is essentially just always now it's just always in us. Yeah yeah exactly. So the cool thing about this gene therapy because when people think gene therapy they're like are you editing my genome that's like CRISPR right CRISPR is what actually editing your genome mm -hmm. you can have offsite targets there's risk with that but this this is a it's a gene therapy because we're inserting a, a foreign plasmid but it's only tra it's only staying in that local so we inject you guys like in your arms right so it's only staying in that local site so the, only the local cells are transformed with that plasmid vector and then it's just producing more of the statin, which and, then goes systemic exactly so my left shoulder is not going to be bigger no than exactly okay. yeah. and that's <laughs> why yeah that's why that's what Michaela thought. She's like, is my arm going to get bigger? She's like, no, no. <laughs> and is there any value of uh, doing more of that or more frequently? Or is it like- we're It saturates. Oh. So that's why I gave you guys two dosages. Because that after that, it doesn't seem it to- doesn't do It doesn't more. do anything more. Yeah. You can wow. inject- I'm, I've tried it on myself. I've done like four doses. <laughs> <laughs> What's the upper limit? Yeah. Yeah. My kind of guy. Yeah. That's what I would do if I was a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what you explained, I think, is one of the- I think probably the, the simplest way for me to explain to someone is, is especially being that we're in our, in our 40s now- there is a clear difference to how I feel like when I'm deconditioned and I get back and get back to the gym versus when I was 20 years old. And like when I was 20, I could have had been off for three months. I yeah. could have had terrible sleep the night before, yeah. eating like terrible, get in the gym, do my thing. And there's, I don't have any right. awful feelings. It's just, oh, I'm getting back in. So I'm weaker. So what? I don't, I don't think about, oh my God, this is rough. 
in your forties or when you're off for that period of time and you get back in and there's always this like ramping up of like, Oh man, this there's, is, it didn't feel that way at all. Yeah, it this, felt like I was 20 again, getting back in this, which is boy, I could see the value of that for someone who's just like really starting. I know we all, because we, we consider ourselves advanced experienced lifters. We're looking for the 10, 15% gains, but I mean, yeah, I could imagine somebody who's in their 40s or 50s who hasn't been lifting for a really long time, the, the feeling of how much that's It'll help kinda, with compliance. Yeah. That's, that, mm -hmm. And that's what I really believe mm -hmm. because yeah. imagine you just get more better feedback because a lot of people have a hard time sticking to the gym because they're like, I'm not really seeing the results, blah, blah. And because this is just, it makes the results come that much faster yeah. and you feel better yeah. when you recover. It yeah. Like so here's an, I mean, this is all subjective, but, um, you know, and people, it's, this is going to be hard to explain for people who don't exercise consistently for years and years and years. <laughs> But there's a, there's a, I, I, once I hit my forties, I just noticed my skin looked a little different as I got really lean. Like I would see a little bit of wrinkling in certain areas, the knee, maybe the gut or whatever. And you see this with older athletes that get really shredded. The skin doesn't look the same. Slowly what's happened to me is, and I said this before with my skin, it's looking like younger. It's really weird. I have the look and I told these guys, it's starting to look the way that it used to, which it wasn't bad at all, but it's just starting to look a lot different. Uh, as we continue, which is really weird to me. So it's all making sense now. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's just because of the immunomodulation effect because of inflammation, which is one of the obviously okay. drivers of skin and muscle aging. Okay. But wait till we get our copper peptide gene therapy. So that'll be available next year. Wow. So you guys can do that. Wow, wow. And the wow. copper, and then now the gene therapy will keep your copper levels back to restoring them for 18 to 24 months. And copper is obviously stimulates collagen production, keeps your skin youthful. I think that will be our biggest product just because cosmetics is cosmetics. Right? And you yeah. know, you'll notice that. Yeah. yeah, even the copper peptide, yeah. you can get, you can get copper peptide, yeah. uh, G GHK topical, and you get a good brand. You even notice within like, Two times, like yeah. two days, you can see a difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's oh, one yeah. of the, the, I mean, I think your, your, was it your wife? No, your wife who did the facial. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we gave her the copper peptide cream afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to piece together from this podcast how often Sal tells us about how good he looks? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I piece that together. Yeah. I'm telling the guys. I'm telling the guys about how great yeah. I was. Tell the guys. How well, no, you know what it is? I talk a lot about little <laughs> things features. that I notice. They make fun of me. Yeah. Like, you feel everything. You notice everything. I just pay attention. It's so subtle. It's so subtle things yeah, yeah. it's weird my clothes just come off i'm just looking at myself in the mirror and i couldn't help yeah. notice <laughs> oh god well what yeah. i noticed okay was like honestly it was really weird because one of my food insensitivities that w across the board was just like completely offensive how I did went, you how did you test did you did so you i went through this whole protocol uh it was like a three-month protocol actually six months even um but went through elimination diets and have gone through this whole process for um, trying to target and figure out like, cause I have like really bad acid reflux and this has just been a chronic problem of mine since I can even remember and would interrupt sleep. And, and then again, it's this vicious cycle. You don't get sleep. And then I'm just constantly inflamed, I'm not even realizing how inflamed my whole body is all the time. Like, so that was the other things people are noticing too. It's like, Oh, you look, your face looks leaner. I think it's just the inflammation yeah. levels have just gone down dramatically. Uh, but it, it like absolved one of my food intolerances, like dairy in general, I can eat it. I can drink it. I can. And, and I was like really slow, cautious, you know, kind of going in and then went full ham, you know, and <laughs> had it, a slice of cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, Like I ate like a, a ton, like so mimolette's one of my favorite. I ate like a ton of it. Like, and anyways, I went a little crazy. Uh, but I still do have like, so I still react a bit to gluten and some, some bits of like, uh, you know, wheat and, and grains and whatnot. So that was one of those things that's interesting that like that one, it seems to be like completely non-offensive anymore, but now, uh, you know, I'm still kind of working my way through that one, but that was the progress to me. That was huge because mm -hmm. I was like, so depressed <laughs> like, when I got the results, no, that's the amazing. cheese was like, kill me. I mean, that's life changing. Obviously it changes mm -hmm. your quality of life. Right? Why aren't, so why aren't these like uh, just so, why aren't they widely available? Like why, why is it so hard to find this kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think one person who has gone in depth through this is, uh, John Abraham, uh, Abrahamson. He's, he wrote a book called sickening, uh, and he was on Lex Friedman's podcast okay. and he, he's a great guy who he basically explains how big pharma has what's called a revolving door with the regulatory body. Yes, they do. Or, so you, you know what that yeah, means. Yeah, People right? work in the FDA. We used to work for Pfizer or whatever, and they go back to the FDA 
and they're promised these massive salaries. It's very interesting. Yeah. So, and he's obviously the expert on that, but the gist of it is that these therapies are going to take away from hospitals, right? Orthopedic surgeries, which are a huge revenue generator. Yeah. And that's what we treat a lot of. And, uh, you know, I have, I have many pro athletes who come to me for that. And there's a reason, right? Because they're orthopedic surgeon on their team and the institutions that represent these teams are all in the, they're all in the same boat together. And they all just want to kind of keep that narrative going, which is that surgery is the only option mm -hmm. or pills are the only option. I'm not saying this works for everyone for everything. It's just something that should be offered and have a specialist consult to see if maybe you're a candidate mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, because right now to see you, someone would have to see you. They can't see you in the States, right? No, it's it's uh, FDA banned peptides now, right? So even with a big part of my practice, there's peptides and I can't even prescribe them anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm essentially like barred, like it just doesn't make sense for me to work here or in Canada anymore because they're they're kind of the same health Canada and FDA. So, so we saw you in Mexico, so you're there. Are yeah, you and, then, um, and then Dubai and then okay. Switzerland and uh, London actually because of Brexit, uh, they're, they're, they t they're actually having uh, oh, cool. you know some changes and their hmm. regulatory stuff. Right. What have you noticed the biggest, uh, have the biggest impact on the people you work with? Is it always a stem cell? I mean, I, so I think from a, as a, I'm a interventionalist, interventional doctor. I like mm -hmm. to, I inject people. I do interventions to help people. Uh, I'm an interventional pain doctor, sports medicine by training. Mm -hmm. And so my, my reason I went into interventional medicine is because I really find it rewarding when I get to actually do something with my hands and make a big difference in people's lives. And so the, the vagus nerve injection, I think has been the most rewarding because it's immediate. And whereas stem cells sometimes can take months and months and I'm just an impatient person. So I'm like, come on, I want to see. But it's, it is amazing to see people's lives change with that. But I've literally had people's lives change with an injection that takes five to 10 minutes and they're no longer suicidal. I had a guy who's a special forces operative. He trained like the, he's, he has a, he trained the guy who has the longest sniper shot in the world. And so it's like 3.2 kilometers, something crazy. And he's like, wow. he's like, he is mentor. And so this guy himself is obviously elite level special forces guy. And he had terrible PTSD. He's in his 40s, Canada being the place where it is, failed the medications. They're like, well, I guess you can go do medically assisted suicide wow. or, ma or made as it's called medically assisted That's dying. so crazy. I can't That's, believe they do that. Yeah. But anyway, I know. And, and, and a veteran who sacrificed and, you know, health. What's country. crazy is they've now included people with mental health issues in that category. Yeah. So being suicidal Average qualifies people. you now to... What is that, right? And, and so, so crazy. And, and so that's, you know, for me, I, I was kind of like, this is really disheartening. Like, is there something I can do? And so that's how I got into this whole mental health stuff was because I'm an interventional doctor and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I was like interventionally trained. And so that's where my head went was the vagus nerve and, you know, exosomes, peptide, all this stuff. So that's, that's what we did for him. And literally 10 minutes later, he was in the parking lot because my, the guy who brought him, the health coach, he told me he was crying and he's like, this is the first time I've had relief in years. Really? Wow, 10 man. minutes later. Wow, is it a painful injection because it's a nerve? Is that no, it's, it, it's not like peripheral nerves. It's not like you're going to nick oh, it. It's okay. not like that. It's just, there might, sometimes you might get a little bit of pain into your shoulder, but most of the time people are like, that was barely anything. It's like a little pinch. You feel it and then it's done. Like wow. I say, it literally takes five minutes. It's so crazy. I'm literally reading all about this right now because- uh, How important is a vagus nerve, Well, right? I mean, yeah. when, when I'm reading about this and people can look this up, I'm not, I'm not even close to like privy on it, but so far what I've read is, I mean, you, when you develop trauma, um, whether it's one big trauma or lots of little traumas, um, this nerve, I mean, it, it basically operates under your awareness. So it's like an automatic thing that's happening in your brain, your body. And by the time you're aware of it, it's too late. Oh shit, I'm anxious. There it is. Now it's that's it. I can't do anything about it. Exactly. Chronic vagus nerve dysfunction is so common. And after COVID, it's a it's long COVID is a, is a it's a common thing with that too. So now even more people have it. Wow. Hmm. Wow. That's this is uh, crazy. Well, okay, be, so it's going to be interesting. I, I mean, I'm really curious to try. I want to do if, that. If it's connected to like I went back to my sister and I both have uh, these uh, you know, she has endometriosis. So that's what she suffers from. And it's interesting that we both had this kind of obviously similar childhood. Right. And so yet very, very different diets and everything else lifestyle was. So the only thing we share in common mm -hmm. is the household that we grew up in. And so there's a part of me that wonders. And then I wonder because I feel like, man, I don't have any stress. I don't feel like I have anxiety. But is that just because 
I've adapted so well to You've that. You've disconnected. And it subconsciously yeah. Your nervous is, system remembers. Right. Like, so is it-, is it <laughs> yeah. And it holds know, it. It holds it. Right. That's is why it, it, is it operating at a different level? And that's why it, the release can be so life-changing for people. I, I, I can't help share this story because it, it was like two weeks ago. I had this girl. She's, she's like 23, 24. She's doing her PhD. And she had to stop doing her PhD because of severe anxiety. And she was getting panic attacks. And she came to a point where she was suicidal. So she was, she was literally, before she came to see me, she was at a hospital, admitted for suicide ideation and so i was like man i don't know if i'm gonna be able to really help her because it's so severe and then 10 minutes after the injection she started crying wow. and saying that i feel relief for the first time in two years because it was just on and she it was just hyper could... arousal it was just on wow. and this just helps to stop that arousal it's wow. unbelievable some yeah. people aren't that fast obviously some people may take a few weeks because it's a little more low grade but for people who are acutely PTSD, trauma, uh, have that nervous system dysfunction, man, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, do you think there's any, cause you, are you, we talked, I think when you were at my house, or we were talking about like a uh, ketamine therapy and psilocybin. Is yeah. It, we combine, it, it kind of gets your body ready for that. Yeah. Right. Because if you're Vegas, if you're in this hyper aroused state, it's going to be harder for you to do those assisted therapies because it's harder for you to go into that relaxed, conscious, you know, subconscious state. Mm -hmm. So what we recommend is we do this and then we send them off for psilocybin so, assisted uh, or whatever. So right. here's the analogy that I would use around this again. And I've been reading a lot about this, but uh, when, when we train people and if they have a movement pattern issue and let's say there's a muscle that is, uh, it's tight. It's tight because the central nervous system identifies right. that, the, that this, this particular joint or movement pattern feels unsafe. And so what we would do as a trainer is we would do what's called correctional exercise. Unfortunately, sometimes they can't even do the mm -hmm. movement properly because their CNS doesn't feel safe. So what we'll do is foam roll or deep tissue massage, press on the muscle. And what that does is it literally temporarily turns that CNS signal off, gets that muscle to kind of chill. Then we can do the correctional exercise and develop a new recruitment pattern. So the analogy here would be like vagus nerve, get that to chill out for a second, then do the therapy so that we can rewire exactly. some of these Exactly, rewire the nervous system. It's okay. a great analogy, and that's exactly you what we're You can use doing. that if you want. I love it. I'm <laughs> definitely going to take that. <laughs> well, really, what it, it's not necessary. I mean, and just to, for the nerds that will get on here and try and correct that, it's not that it's turning it off. It's, that no, it's, it's calming just, it down. Yes, yes. Because yes. still, there's still a central nervous system connection there. Correct, It's, correct. A, it's overactive, right. which is when why. Press, that's it, why when you have a knot, it's, it's, modu it's modulated. Right, right, right. And that's, right. That's, the whole, that's the word I always like to use, modulated, right? That's the theme of this discussion, right? Immunomodulation for your immune system, nervous system system modulation, yeah. right? It's, it's all about reprogramming. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so we should see more benefits over the next few months then since we haven't That's even felt Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, the, the benefits with recovery, sleep, and all that stuff can be more profound after a few months. Yeah. Wow. I'm what, did, what did you say? The, the poop pills are ready again? They should be ready I by I April. Call it that. I want yeah. By April? <laughs> yeah. You guys sent some Got renewal. Way, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, no, for we sure. All we'll get you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> you, you guys, but you guys want that poop. Olympic athletes poop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the poop. What happens if you drop the capsule? Surprise me. How do you want to know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, the pills Which one? <laughs> no, they're dry froze. Okay. They're dry freeze. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like if you left it out, I guess if you left it I already have a hard time taking pills. I'm going to have a real hard time taking pills. Worse than fish burps after a DHA. But think about the, there's a, there's a company that just got a Approved to do a fast track FDA approval in the states, so they are becoming more accessible. So I, I, I had. Uh, do you guys know Nick Mitchell, mm -mm. the that ultimate performance guy, UP? He was a good friends with Paul Quinn. So. Oh yeah, okay. I, I've, I've seen his stuff. He he has a he has a theory that he thinks F, the pills, those FMT pills, will be the most prescribed medicine in ten years. Wow. wow. I, I and I, I agree with him. I'm, I I could see that because mm -hmm. we'll have so many different versions by then, and there'll be so many different uses for it. And we all know the gut yeah, the is where a everything. lot of problems oh, start, gosh. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have a lot of uh, professional athletes? that you just can't talk about because they come see you and like they can't. I think it's such a, it's just so cool to be able to get these guys back to their the elite top level. It's it's fun working with them too. It's like, it's completely different from working with someone, you know, who's like PTSD trauma and working with like an elite high level right, right. athlete. Totally different. Totally, totally, totally different. And, but I, I like both are, to me, are yeah. equally rewarding because it's just helping getting back to people what they want to do. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now at the, at the moment, these, these treatments unfortunately are not uh, inexpensive. There are, they're, they're up there. Yeah. In terms of the treatments. Uh, but at, do you see in the future at some point this being something that... Even uh, it's cheaper than it was last year. So, I mean, it's already that's progress. That's progress, right? Yeah. And that's going to continue to become cheaper because once we have the second generation one, then all of a sudden we have the second generation one that's for the more, let's say, like celebrity elite clientele. And then we'll have the regular one that are still effective for many things and will be cheaper because the one that's more expensive will be able to allow us to drop the price for the old one. I always, I always, I love the... 
I mean, I love what Elon did with Tesla back in the day because yeah. that he had that vision. Unfortunately, I don't know what he's doing now, but <laughs> but for but back in 2010, he had the vision to be like, okay, if I want to get a mainstream car to everyone, we have to have a very expensive car that maybe isn't that great, but we have to give it to celebrities and famous people first because that's the only way it's going to become mainstream. That's right. So he gave it to like Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Cruise. He would just be like, here, take the car, try it out. Let me know what you think. And like, you know, it wasn't that great. It was like just a bunch of lithium ion batteries like taped together and like it didn't go that far, but it was enough. And he was able to sell enough to kind of fund the next iteration, which was like the Model X or sorry, the Model S. It was a Roadster, then the Model S, then the Model X. But those were all like hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars cars. Yeah, now you can go get one for 30 grand. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the exact same analogy because it's many, the many manufacturing process of growing stem cells and gene therapies, all this stuff is improving. And the investment into aging, especially is massive. All the, you know, all the rich people, they all want to live longer, right? Yeah. And they all, they all putting a huge investment into this. And like I said earlier, if we can solve aging, we can solve a lot of these chronic diseases and it'll just mean more accessibility. So to me, this is actually, a lot of people may criticize, oh, he only treats rich people. I would actually say is democratizing health for everyone because eventually these treatments will be affordable for everyone and they will be so effective for so many different chronic diseases. So that's the future I see where these treatments become cheaper and more accessible. There's always some dummy that will say mm -hmm. that right now, but that's just how, that's just the process. <laughs> that's right everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah look at like, electronics. Remember flat screen so TVs? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There, was, there was a time Dude, plasma TVs were like yeah. 20 grand. Yeah, yeah. 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 And now you, everyone's got four in their house. So relax. It's yeah. just, it's part of the process. Yeah, cool. So, uh, you know, we, this is now the second time we've had you and I feel like the entire first time and so far this time, so it's over, over an hour, we take advantage of your brain and we, and we just <laughs> ask all these questions. I actually want to know a little more on the personal side of like, how does, how does a, a father husband balance his life when you have something that you're so passionate about right now that is so cutting edge, so important, right? To I think society, what we're doing. How do you find the, the time to be, to be dad? And do you wrestle with that at all? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate because my wife is like super, super supportive. And she, I mean, you guys met her and yeah. she's, and she's also, she kind of gets the bigger picture. She's, she's kind of like, okay, we're sacrificing, but this is because it's for the greater good. And it's because we're trying to actually make it. And she knows like, I'm so, I mean, I know it sounds a little grandiose, but like, I, I mean, I think it can benefit all of humanity. Like yeah. in that sense that if we push these fields, these therapies forward, it can be something that can benefit everyone across the globe. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of people suffering and there's so many people with chronic illnesses suffering and they have no hope. And with these gene therapies what and cell therapies, eventually we'll be able to help so many people who right now aren't getting help. And being able to make this more accessible to more part of the world, Yes, it sucks in terms of how much sacrifice there is from family and personal things. And even now, like we were talking about, I probably have to move. And, and like, mm -hmm. it's like, it sucks. Like I'm going to have to leave Canada, but it's like, I, I'm doing it for something. That mission is bigger than just me. You know what I mean? And so, I feel like there's so many people helping me now in this mission and so many bright people that I have, like amazing scientists, like obviously the podcast, getting the word out there. And I, I feel like it would be, you know, it would be short-sighted to just say, oh, well, I'm just going to, I just want to spend more family time. Like, I obviously I do, but at the same time, it's like, I think this is why I'm here and I'm just trying to do my purpose. Right? So did she, when you guys first got together, did she know that she was signing up for that? Or is that something that you've had to communicate throughout the relationship? No, definitely. I I mean, I don't think anyone, I, I mean, maybe some people can, but like, I, I feel like when you're on this, there's no way you can predict that this path would have happened. I, I, I feel like for a lot of people who are, you know, get uber successful or whatever. Like, it's really hard to predict that. Like, you would, how could you have known 10 years ago, this is where you would be? Mm -hmm. And it, it, for me, it was like, I was, I, I always knew I'd, I thought a little bit differently from most doctors, but I never thought I'd be like, you know, like Tony Robbins, for example, like he's probably the most like, influential person in my life from like 18 or years old. And like the fact that I got to treat him and now he's, we're friends kind of like, yeah. it's just so weird. It's, it's mm -hmm. like surreal for me. And it's just like, like, I, I love the guy, like I, I, but I can't, I can't fanboy him when I'm treating him, but, <laughs> like, <laughs> but like, just like, just because of the stuff, like to me, I, like I've never, I've never been into like celebrities so much, but like, like Tony to me is like such a genuine nice guy who tries to help people. And like, I always just, he always inspired me. And like the fact that I'm able to, I was able to get shoulder better, help him with so many different things. And like, he's really thankful. Like, it's just such a weird, Weird, but almost like like this weird interconnected thing where I feel like okay now I'm helping the people who help me and like I feel like I have the means to help more people so why not try uh, and and that's yeah and so 
So my wife is very, uh, she's tired of me not being home, but she's supportive of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that, would you say that's the the biggest challenge or I don't even want to say fight because I'm not, I'm not going to assume that you guys fight over it, but is would that be one of the most challenging things that you guys have to deal with as a parent and as a husband? Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's so I think the other thing too, it, like I don't want to, I, there's, a, there's, do you guys know Inky Johnson? Mm. He's a, uh, do you know Eric Thomas? Yes. Motivational yeah, speaker. Yeah, Inky Johnson is another one like that type of level. Oh, and he, okay. he has this really good saying. He's like public success, public success, but private failure. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of people. A lot. Uh, and including like Mr. Richest Man on Earth, right? Like Elon, like he has nine kids and like he can't, like he's into a fight with his ex-wife about seeing the kid. Like I'm not, I don't know all the personal details, but the point is there's, the man is obviously struggling personally. And like, I think you can be publicly successful, but if you don't have a good home life and family life, what's the point? So yeah. there has to come a point where if, 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 you know, if something I have to choose, like I would always choose family first, but I'm not at that point. But let's just say if I got to a point where it's like, man, if you was like, you're traveling too much, you're way too much, you need to cut back. I would be like, okay, you would, I would. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think what you just said, uh, this is actually something that I share all the time with, with people that, cause we've now had the opportunity to be even closer to a lot of famous, successful people is I think people would be surprised, uh, how many of those people have a very dysfunctional home life now, on the outside. They're famous. They're in movies or this pro fat, the professional athlete, they've got millions and millions of dollars but then their wife hates them, their kids don't like them, and like we don't see a lot of that stuff, and yet we, ad we admire and we put these people on these pedestals all the time, but very few of them actually have that balance. And, a lot of stress. And you know what one of the ironies is for people who are health conscious, social connection and meaning and emotional uh, like relationships are actually one of the best protectors for health. And this was shown in a study, I think it's called the Rosetta effect. Cause it's this yes. count. Yeah. You know about it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. No, talk about it. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, so yeah. basically these, this like Mediterranean community of like Italians, Italians. Believe, yeah, yeah. that basically, you know, smoked, <laughs> didn't really exercise, live pretty poor lifestyles, but then they would get together like five days a week and hang out and play games and just like, just chill basically. Yeah. And that had so many protective benefits for cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer. So it's obviously we're social creatures and we're meant to bond and relate with one another and who better, obviously your family is the best people to bond with. Yeah. And if you can't even have meaningful relationships with them, I think it questions like not only character, but really like your priorities. Right. And so, and that's the thing, that's, that's the thing that bugs me about Brian Johnson, the guy who's spending $2 million a year on his body and like, you know, making a lot of headlines yeah. and going on a lot of podcasts, but the man like, you know, he, he, I, I know, I know he's, he doesn't have the best relationships with people. You know what I mean? And like, it's like, so what are you really doing? You're spending all this time on yourself and trying to live forever, but like no one likes you. So <laughs> I mean, like, I, I love that like, you bring that up because <laughs> it, we talk about that all the time uh, on here about how important it is to have community and to have, and to work on the relationship. That's a part of health. Yeah. In fact, it's a massive part of health. The, the, the point of that study, you have people that drink, smoke, do all these other things that we know are really bad, but yet they can live longer lives just because they poor, have poor breaking. relationship was shown in a, a Stanford study to, to affect your health uh, as much as a pack of cigarettes pack a day. Of cigarettes, exactly. Yeah. Loneliness is a more predictor of mortality than I believe smoking a pack of cigarettes. Yes. Yeah. So loneliness is, and loneliness is on the rise, which is like, Huge. How, why are people becoming yeah. more lonely in such an interconnected so this world? This has actually <laughs> been called the loneliness epidemic Yeah, and it's affecting everybody, including children. You know what it's affecting the most? Men, married men. Mm. Yeah, married men are, are experiencing uh, terrible loneliness at, at ri ridiculous levels. Kids, though, for sure. Kids used to never be lonely. What's the theory on that? Why? Because why guys don't go out and try to make friends. So yeah. and it's just getting worse and worse. Whereas we used to be forced right. to meet people because of things we had to do. Now men are going to work, coming home, and that's it. And it's, so we already suffered from loneliness at higher rates, but now it's like through the roof. Yeah. So Arthur Brooks was telling me about that the other day. Before you came in, we we were having a, a, a dad discussion about the things that like I was sharing with the guys, what I'm most fearful of, of, you know, the challenge. And one of mine is just, I have this like overly sweet son and he's just like, he's like, and he's so good that like, I just don't, I don't ever have to discipline him. And it's like, and here he's already four going on five years old. And I'm like, man, I want him to be tough though. And I want him to have some resiliency and he has nowhere near the adversity I had growing up yet. I know I don't want to put him through the same thing. And so I wrestle with that as a dad. I mean, is there anything right now with your kids' ages that you uh, you wrestle with? As yeah, far? no, same, same. And I've talked about it with a lot of my high net worth patients because they've gone through that struggle too. It's like, 
it's not normal to like, you know, drive a Tesla and like go on all these vacations. And that's not a normal life. Right. Yeah. But my kids think that's a normal life. And, and I, and I grew up, I, I grew up from immigrant family poor as well. And like, so it's like, how do I get them to have that perspective? The only, the only solution I've seen is travel. And, and that's why I take Showing them. them. Exactly. And oh. I travel, I, I, I try to take them as much, many places as I can take them with me to different places and try to show them that there's obviously so much more in the world and people who unfortunately in their situations and where they're born, they may, they never have the same opportunity that we have. Yeah, so yeah. you got to take it, you know, and then show them that we're so privileged and blessed. And as it's, it's on us, it's our social responsibility, I believe, to be able to, to give back. And that's what Charlie Munger unfortunately passed away recently. I don't know if you guys know much about him. But I didn't he, know Munger just passed away. Yeah. yeah. When did he die? Just got like last month. Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't yeah know and that. he was, he was probably my favorite uh, billionaire because he, you know, being friends with Warren Buffett, he obviously got a lot of um, notoriety too, but he was one of the ones who really talked about this concept of social responsibility and like giving back. And he, he, and he obviously like lived it, right. He gave back mm -hmm. everything to charity and to other d causes. And that that's, that's the same philosophy I have is, is, is if we're privileged enough and we show our kids that this is what we're doing with it, your kids are going to inevitably get be more influenced by you. So yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I'll show you off air because I don't want to totally mess it up on air. And I will I'll promise the audience that hears this that we will we'll post it and share it. But I just saw the coolest uh, way to tell your kids about Santa Claus. And it's along the lines of like that if Santa exists or not, the kid asks. I'll share the story with you when we get off air right now. But it's it's really cool because the lesson is teaching to give without expecting anything in return. And the way the dad teaches the the son uh, if there is a Santa or not is really cool. So I'll share that with you. It's really cool. I love yeah. it. Dr. Khan, it was awesome talking to you again. Yeah. Yep. You've just totally sold me on coming back to see you. For <laughs> I, know, right? I want to get the yeah. Vegas nerve thing. That's what I want to get for sure. Yeah, it, let's do it. Like I said, I'm reading about that and I'm like, I got that. Yeah. Stuff. I need some help with that. Good it's, deal. We'll schedule another time to come see you, my friend. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Appreciate it.